today. We'll start just a few minutes early today. It seems like we're all about here, and uh, we have a few minutes, but uh, have a couple announcements. But want to thank you for coming out today, and we thank God. It was a beautiful day yesterday. It really was. It was probably one of the nice, most nice Fourth of July since I've lived in Ohio that I've seen, um, which was a bittersweet thing because that just meant that the streets were really dirty yesterday that we had to clean up. Thank the Lord. It went quick and it went easy. I got home before midnight. It was like 10.40. I was happy about that. And I thank God for that very, very much. But uh, we appreciate you coming out. I do want to just take this time real quick to let you know um, what we did as a church in the parade yesterday. It was just wonderful. It really was. And I know um, physically some people weren't able to be there. I know that others had plans. We understand that. We appreciate your prayers very, very much. And, but also appreciate the ones that came out. Um, somehow... Like, me and John and Kaylee ended up on the back of the truck, and all the ladies were walking and doing all the work. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, next year I ain't riding the truck. I'm going to get down. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we handed out 1,200 um, ice pops, and we ran out um, early, <coughs> big time. And uh, I think next year we're going we're gonna to get at least 2,500. Uh, we did. We ran out big time. People were really wanting those things, and uh, they were a big hit. Um, I made 300 flyers, copies, and uh, along paired them with pen and information to our church. And all 300 of them are gone, and they were gone early. So uh, we had a lot of, of, you know, it only cost us ten dollars as a church to be in the parade, and uh, there was probably over at least four thousand people that were up there. So it was uh, it was a great way to really get uh, our name out there, but also our VBS and information about our church, and not to mention we also had a really, really good time, and we really did, so at one point, Kaylee, when we were all done, she was on the truck, and she was just looking at people saying, oh, go on, no more, no more, they were like, that's okay, that's okay, but uh, we had a great time yesterday, and uh, it was a blessing, I, as I looked around at, at the different ones that were there, it, it blessed my heart. <coughs> said that, we'll go ahead and open up in a good word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just love you and we're thankful, Lord, for an opportunity we have to be in your house. God, we praise you for everyone that was able to be here today, the God that took that time to be here. And Father, I know that when we go here today from this place that we will be satisfied. God, when we come expecting, Lord, we know that we'll go receiving. We pray that you'd feed us from your word today. We thank you, Lord, for, for yesterday and God, what it means to us as a nation but God, also the reminders that it brings, Lord, spiritually to our hearts and minds of what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. Lord, we love you, and we just pray, God, that there will be a soul saved today. And God, we pray that there would be a saint that would be encouraged and lifted up. And we just pray that everything that's done and said here today would be for your honor and glory. We love you and praise you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You turn your songbook to page 484. Page 484. And if you're able, would you stand for the same?
chapter 8. Father, I pray now that you would look in my heart of hearts. God, if there would be anything that would be a 
hindrance today, any sin, God, forgive it, remove it, anything, God, within me or within this place, God, by the blood of Christ, let it be uh, cleansed, Lord, and let it be today that your word goes out under the unction of the Holy One, Father, and rests upon the hearts and the lives of the people. God, we come here today praising you, thanking you, desiring you to move, and God, we know that anything that's done and said here today will not be for our honor and glory, it will be for yours, and God, that's what we desire today. God, save that one that's closest to hell. And Father, encourage that saint. God, meet that special need here today. We know that you're able. In Christ's awesome name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Some of the oppression that these colonists or the colonies were receiving from the king of Great Britain, they referred to it as tyranny. And I only wrote down a few. When you read the Declaration of Independence, they list them. I don't know how many people have ever read it, but you can read the whole Declaration of Independence and you see also a list of the reasons why they wanted to be separated and liberated from the oppression of the King of Great Britain. The King invaded the rights of the people. He sent his officers to harass them. He manipulated them into giving in to his desires in several different ways. He imposed taxes without counsel uh, or without consent. He defended and protected his own armed troops from the murders that they committed while they were in the States. They cut off the, the col colonial uh, trade and with all parts of the world. He ravaged their coast, burnt their homes, destroyed the lives of their people. He abolished their most valuable laws and altered fundamentally their uh, forms of government. He forced their soldiers, uh, their sailors actually, to become, when, when a colonial sailor would be captive at sea by uh, Great Britain, or by their soldiers, they would be turned and made to fight their own people. And these were just some of the things that were taking place at this time, and they wanted to be free from this. On July 4, 1776, the final draft of the Declaration of Independence was signed, and on July 8th, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Liberty Bell that weighed 2,000 pounds, that actually had scripture on it like a lot, Hey, of our different uh, monuments today. It had Leviticus 25 on it, verse 10, proclaim liberty throughout all the Lord, land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And on July 8, 1776, they sounded the liberty bell to let people know that all would be summoned that could hear it because they were going to read the Declaration of Independence to the people. That was the first reading that took place of the final draft up to the signatures. That bell is actually, just a side note, is unusual today. They tap it from time to time on special occasions, like the 4th of July in 1944, when the Allies' uh, troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. It was sounded then, and that Liberty Bell was something that, that was a, kind of a type of a symbol. When that sound rang, it just was a freedom sound. It was something that people uh, reckoned and likened unto a recognizing of freedom. And that bell is now unusable today, but it's still they tap it from time to time. Abe Lincoln, he said in reference to the forefathers and fathers, he said that they were iron men, is what they said. That they fought for the principle that they were contending for. He said, and we understand by what they then did and has followed that degree of prosperity that we now enjoy and has come to us. He said, we hold this celebration most likely speaking in reference to the 4th of July, we hold the celebration to remind ourselves of all the good done and of how it was done and who did it and how we are historically connected to it. One of the things I want to talk to you about this morning right before that we get into our text, Francis Scott Key, we've heard of him, he's the one that penned the words the Star Spangled Banner. You can YouTube it, Google it, whatever, and you can see the story behind that. He was a lawyer for the colonies. And there were many prisoners taken by Britain and also by the colonies of one another's troops. And Great Britain kept all of their prisoners, their colonial prisoners, in the bottom of a ship in the hold in the bay. And it was the desire of the uh, co colonies, the colonials, that they would send forth a man to negotiate a prisoner swap. They wanted their prisoners back. They wanted to free them. So they sent Francis Scott Key, and he went. And when he went, he was happy because 
The fact is, he, he was glad because he got to talk with them, and they decided that they would do a one-for-one -one swap. You give us one of our prisoners, and we'll give you one of yours. And that's what they decided to do. And he went down into the hole, and he said, Man, I have good news. He said, You're free. He says, You're free. And he went back up the steps. And when he went back up the steps, and, and the captain of that ship, that spokesperson met him and said, You know what? All this is now for naught. He said, in two hours, he says, it's not going to matter anymore. And he said, well, what do you mean? Why is that? He said, look out into that harbor. He says, do you see that in the distance? He says, that is the entire British war fleet that's coming. He said, in two hours, your swap isn't going to mean anything. It's for naught. It's not even going to take place. And he said, do you see that there? And there was Fort McHenry. He said, the entire fleet has orders that they are to bombshell that fort repeatedly until you submit. And he said, because he said, you can't do that. He said, predominantly, that, that's not even a military fort. That's mostly just women and children. But that's where there was a flag that was uh, set up on the rampart that was out that people could see. And it was the United States flag. It was the American flag is what it was. And they said, you do have a way out, is what he told Key. He said, if you lower that flag, that will be symbolic of your, your submittance. And he says, and then it will spare the people. Two hours came, the ship, the fleet was there, the flag still remained. And he went down, Key went down, and he said, listen, he told all the prisoners what was going to happen. He says, but I will come down and I will tell you the things that take place. And he went back up again, and they began to bombard that that to fort, and they shot on it, and shot on it, and shot on it for two hours. The, they were exploding, and there was, there was, it was dark, and there was all kinds of flashes, and there was smoke, and every now and again you could get a glimpse, you could see the flag, and he would go down, and he would tell the truth. He said, the flag's still standing. They said, is the flag still there? Is the flag still there? He said, it's still standing. It's still there. It's still there. And he said, he went back up again, and went back up, and they began, even still, the, the captain said, I don't understand. He says, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with your people? He says, this don't need to be. He said, if you just uh, uh, submit, if you just surrender. He said, we, I don't know why that flag's still standing. He says, we have reports of our own reconnaissance that that flag's been hit many times directly. And it still stands. And he said, he went down as he stood at the top of the steps. He heard all those prisoners down there. He said, he heard those men praying. God, don't let that flag fall. Hold the flag up. They were praying to God. Hold it up. Hold it up. You know what? They were Christians, folks. I'll tell you now. George Washington himself said, said there's, there's none that can compare to the Christian soldier. He said because he would rather die on his feet than spend his life on his knees meant as a prisoner. And they were down there and they were praying. They were praying. And he said for the next three hours, even after that, they continued. They pulled all forces together and shot and shot and shot. And said, so we know that we don't understand why the flag is still standing. It's still standing. It's still standing. All through the night, they shot on this and shot on this and shot on this. And finally the dawn came and they stopped firing. And all through the night, he told them, he said, man, the, the, the flag is still standing. It's still standing. And then they noticed in the morning it was still standing, but it was at an unusual angle, but the flag was still flying. And he got a chance to get off the boat and to go and see. And he found out why. He said, what took place is they found out. The Britons even found out the reason that the flag stood is because when people would go and they were shooting on this, what took place is that that flag did get hit many times. And did get knocked down, but there would be men that would run out. Not wanting the flag that, that they held dear to them, knowing what it stood for, what it symbolized to touch the ground. They'd go out and they'd hold that flag up. It wasn't be in the ground no more. It stood because there were people holding it up. And when they would get killed because of the direct hits and because of the bombing that was taking place, the shelling that was taking place, people would go, their fellow man and their brother would drag them out of the way, and then they would go and they would raise a flag back up. And they found out the next day the reason that that flag was angled but still standing because there was dead bodies of people that held it dear that were there, that had it was leaned up against, that held, were holding that flag when they died. And that's the reason they say that it still stood. Do you know there's people that really did love this country? And you know what? They really did give their life's blood 
for us to be free. Freedom is something. Freedom is something that is free to you and I, but it costs somebody something somewhere. And today you got the Eric Shepherd Challenge. You hear that yet? Eric Shepherd challenges like the, the cold water challenge. He's telling people, get the American flag out and videotape yourself and post it on the social media of stomping the flag and people walking on the flag, laying on the ground. That's what they're doing. You can see it. My father-in-law told me about it yesterday. I said, I've never heard of it. I looked at it this morning. You can see it. It's all over social media. That's what people are doing. And I know what I say. I say, listen, if you do not like this country, honestly, and I don't say this to you because you're here, but if someone does not like this country, then they should just leave. Amen. Honestly, there were people, this nation was founded, one nation under God. If you don't want to be on a nation under God, then go to one of those heathen nations that don't serve God. Because if you walked on their flag, they'd chop your feet off. That's what would happen. But today, you know what happens when freedom becomes something that people, the Bible says that we should not use freedom for an occasion to sin. And people are doing that today. They're taking freedom and saying, I'm so free, I can do what I want. No. 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 That's not what that means. But those things remind me. Those things remind me that I am proud to be an American, and I do know that people shed their life's blood for this country because of God, and because God founded it, and because of what it stood for. And also it reminds me of what Jesus did. Because there is a bondage, there is a slavery that exists still today, that man could not pay a price to redeem himself. Man cannot do enough, say enough eloquent words to get himself out from underneath its yoke. He cannot do enough good for the slave master in order to be deemed free. There's nothing that he can do within himself, by himself, to himself, because of himself, whatsoever, to get himself out underneath of that yoke. There's a slavery that exists today. There's a slavery that exists today. However, there was a price that was paid. Amen. There really was. And when I hear about men, about people that were given this country, men and women gave their lives for this nation. And today, people trample foot on the American flag, saying the flag stands for racism and stands for this and all this other stuff. The White House itself, the White House itself disrespects all that the forefathers had when they advertised the rainbow right. on the White House. Amen. Amen, brother. Why? Not because they're reminding of what the rainbow means, which was God's love and mercy and grace, and He would never again judge man in the way that He did when He flooded the earth. That's what it meant. God's promise is what that symbolized. And today, it's taken and used for an occasion to sin. It means the sodomite pride is what it is. Right. Gay pride and whatever you want to say, the homosexual, the euphemite, I don't care what you say it is. And they put it on the White House. This nation, I'll tell you now, is far from what it's supposed to be. They have used their liberty for an occasion to sin. Right. Their life and liberty and pursuit of happiness means now if you feel it, do it. If it feels good, do it. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto the man. Amen. And the ends thereof are the ways of death. That's right. So today we see as long as you feel good, do it. You see it all over. Feel good. If it feels right, go ahead. Just do it if it feels right. The problem with that is, is that a man's conscience can be defiled by decisions he makes. Amen. He has a conscience that he's been given by God. Everyone has one. But when they deny their conscience or are trained otherwise, they don't have one anymore. It's seared with a hot iron. They don't feel right and wrong. Whatever you feel in your heart is right and wrong. You're your own God. Do what you want. And that's the nation we live in today. Listen. I'm not saying today that there aren't Christian people here. We understand. We know that. But it also doesn't mean that we should not pray. And we should not seek God for our leadership in this country. Amen. I do not approve of their actions, but they are lost souls that need Jesus. And we should pray for God to save them and guide them is what we need. God is the one that says it's over. Not you and I. So we need to pray like crazy for this. Now having said that, we want to just look at a few things. The proclamation of liberty. Jesus said, if you can, shall can 
continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. That is a message of hope, is what it is. Jesus said, thy word is truth, is what he said. What is the declaration? The declaration is the gospel is what it is. It is the message of hope to those that are captive and are under, under bondage of sin. Ephesians 1.13, it says, After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation is what it is. 1 Corinthians 15, it says that Christ Jesus died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again according to the scripture. That is the gospel, and that is the good news to them who are under the bondage and slavery of sin. That is the good news. That is the proclamation of freedom to this world, is what it is. We must proclaim that same very known truth today. We proclaim that liberty, that freedom today is what we do. Paul said this. He said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel is what he says. Brother Ron, you and I need to preach the gospel. Amen. There's really nothing else that you should be preaching other than the gospel. Amen. You know what? There's a lot of people that got a lot of pains. We don't need to preach. Oh, what doctrine is, doctrine that. Preach the gospel is what it is. Amen. That's what saves people. That's right. It's the gospel. Amen. That is the good news. That is what liberates people. It is the gospel. It is the message of hope that sat around the world. That's like that liberty bell sounds. I'll tell you now. Every time someone hears the gospel and someone goes to Jesus in faith, I believe that there's a liberty bell in heaven that Amen. sounds out that someone else just got saved and their name gets called out. Amen. There's hope today. And it's in the gospel message. That's what we need to preach. Listen, we don't need a church that tries to change the fundamentals of the gospel and needs to come up with some new age, newfangled thing because we're going to draw people in. I'll tell you, you'll draw as a man or as a woman, you'll draw so many people and then you'll offend them and they'll leave. But when Jesus Christ cannot offend them, why? Because he can't do wrong. He can't. When people are drawn through the gospel, they're not drawn to the preacher. They're not drawn to the church people. They're drawn to Jesus. And that is the one. That's the gospel. That is the message of liberty, of hope, the proclamation of liberty. Amen. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he anointed me to preach the gospel Amen. unto the poor. To preach the gospel. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the word. Don't say preach anything else. It doesn't say tell people how to buy a car. It doesn't say tell people how to pay the taxes. It says preach the word is what it Amen. says. Preach the word. Amen. Do you know... The main thread, the main thrust of the New Testament is preaching. That's what it is. It's preaching. It started with John preaching the baptism of repentance. John the Baptist. And it ended with John the Apostle giving the invitation. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. It's preaching. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Repre preaching repentance. Repeating salvation is what it is. And it's the gospel message, the proclamation of liberty. That is something that is a sweet sound of the year. That's something that people need to hear today. I had read that in the Emancipation Proclamation, when that took place, that there were some slaves that did not realize that they were free. Do you know why? Because no one told them. <laughs> do you understand today that that same thing takes place? There are people that do not realize that there's a way out. There's freedom. Because why? Because you know what the devil does. Gets the focus on now and on today. Gets a focus on buy, sell, get gain. Live how you feel is what it is today. There's a message today that people need to hear. They don't know that there's a freedom that takes place. And that freedom is found in Christ Jesus. Amen. That freedom is from their sin. People need to hear that today. That's why it's important that it's not just a preacher's job. It's not just a Sunday school teacher's job. The truth of the matter is, the way that we live for the Lord Jesus and the things that we say, those things are the things that testify of the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we can be saved. Those are the things that need to be proclaimed today. The proclamation of liberty. The proclamation of liberty. People must be told. They must be told. They must be told. Do you know, it confuses the world when Christians fight amongst themselves. <laughs> they really do. They fight amongst themselves. Sometimes they're worse than lost people. I had someone tell me, well, nah, they're not a credible source thing. They needed to get saved themselves. The proclamation of liberty. You and I need to proclaim that there is a way and that all are condemned under that. They are all fall under the heading of being under the slavery and bondage of sin. 
It does not matter who you are. It does not matter, and I'll tell you why. Why? The purpose. The purpose of liberty. The purpose of freedom. The purpose of freedom is the fact that, as I said, there is a slavery that takes place, and that is taking place. Verse 33 through 35 is what we had read. They answered him, once Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They said, we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. So how do you say that we shall be made free? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. That scripture right there holds all men guilty in the eyes of God. Amen. Whosoever, you understand? That word servant is talking about a slave. Whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin, is what the Bible says. Whosoever committed sin, that, that's why there is a purpose of liberty. There's a purpose. Liberty, freedom is needed. It's needed. It's a universal bondage is what it is. Listen, when Jesus told them a spiritual truth, what did they do? The same thing that man does. He always takes a spiritual message and tries to it naturally within himself in the flesh apply it spiritually or physically. Physically, I'll tell you why. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, Jesus said, you must be born again. And he's like, well, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb? Jesus was talking about spiritual, and he defaulted to physical. The woman in the well, Jesus said, if you're thirsty, he said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and I'll give him living water. And what Jesus said, sir, give me this water. I don't have to come back and draw anymore. Man always defaults to a physical, physical, physical. Why? That's what they did. Jesus told them, he says, you'll know the truth. The truth should make you free. They had so much pride in their lineage. And of who they came from. They said, we be Abraham's seed. We're Abraham's seed. And he told them, he said, the servant doesn't abide in the house forever. He doesn't abide in the house forever, is what he told them. Hey, they were saying that they were a son, but they weren't. They're a servant. Why? Because they commit sin. But they said, well, we're not a bondage. We're not a Gentile. We're, we're Jews born. We got clean heritage because it's of Abraham. They defaulted to physical when Jesus was talking about spiritual. Amen. Whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. They're like, what are you talking about that we're not free? What are you talking about that we're not free? And that's why Jesus told them that. You're not free. You're not. Yes, you're not a Gentile. You are a Jew, but you're not free. You're not free. Why? Because you commit sin. And whoso commits sin is a servant of sin. And you say, well, I am a Christian and I still sin. I'm going to talk to you about that real quick. But today, first, the devil, he gets a focus of people, of men and of women, focusing on the physical instead of the spiritual. Why? Well, you only need to worry about your physical needs. You don't need to worry about spiritual. I mean, that's what people want. Now listen, now Christians can use that to their advantage in a sense, and I don't mean manipulative, but I'll tell you now, with, with eagle's nest, I, that's a good example, and it's, I only say that because I've been here and I've seen it. A lot of camp meetings are church people. Nothing against that. They're, that's good. We need to get fired up. There's nothing wrong with that. But the camp meetings that we had done, there's not a lot of church people there. And it's because you go to the places that the people are down and out and have what? A physical need. If you just say, hey, come out. We're just gonna, we're gonna be preaching. I bet you one out of 150 just last month would have even showed up. Why? Because they don't care about the spiritual. They said, I need clothes, I need food. So when you tell them, hey, we got free clothes, and we have free food, and we got free bikes for your children, they're coming like crazy. They show up, and then once they get there, you say, listen, those things are available right after the service. And then you preach to their spiritual need, the one that they're not focused on, and then the Holy Spirit of God makes them realize right then and there that they have a need greater than what they even thought. And people get saved. Why? Because man will focus on his physical today. He'll be like, don't worry about spiritual. I can just get right before I die. I need to worry about now. That's the big lie of the devil. That's the big focus. The great illusion today. Don't worry about your spiritual need. You can take care of that later. But right now, you just need to, you need to do what you have to do. And that's the big lie today. Because the truth of the matter is, whosoever commits sin and serve of sin and all of sin is for the glory of God. These folks here claim security in Abraham as being his seed and free. Jesus told them, 
The servant abideth not in the house forever. Listen, a slave can't claim safety in the house because he's not a son. He's not a son. Why? He can be sold at any time. He's not secure. He's not safe. He can be sold at any time. Why? The Bible says that we are sold under sin. If a, son, if, if a man or a woman, if a soul is without Jesus Christ, they are still under sin. They are sold under sin. They can be sold at any time. At any time, that sin debt can be cashed in and paid, and then it's over. Sin will claim its debt. The wages of sin is debt. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is an independence day that needs to take place for every soul that ever walked the face of the earth. There really is. And it needs to be told. The purpose of that is because there is a need for that. The word committeth means to practice. That's what it means. It means to practice. It means a continual. He that committeth sin is a servant of sin. That continual sinning is a servant of sin is what the Bible says. Continual sin. That's not talking about a Christian. Okay? That strives. As the Bible says that we strive against sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That Bible says God forbid. It doesn't say man forbid. It says God forbid. Amen. When we are a child of God, a true child of God, we will not want to sin. We will not purposely sin. Now, we may sin. When we strive against sin, we do fall sometimes. I understand that. We will. Okay? But we should strive against sin. That committed is a, is a word that is continual. It means a continual sin. And know what? That is one who is not under the blood. Amen. Because why? They're a slave to it. You cannot stop. You cannot cease. Because you've not been made a new creature. You can't do it. You can't. That's why there's a need for freedom. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. The purpose of liberty. 1 John 3, 9 and 10 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin, is what it says. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, it says, in that, verse 9, it says, in verse 10, the children of God are manifest. That means they're shown. You can see, you're aware. Why? And the children of the devil. You can see the children of the devil. Why? Because whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. There's a lot of people who say, oh, I'm saved, I'm okay. But if they are continuing in sin from the heart, they're not saved. The scripture Amen. says it. I don't care if they say they got saved. I'm telling you, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. If Amen. someone is in continual sin, you cannot be a child of God. And they're striving. If they're not striving against it and doing it willingly from the heart, they are not born of God is what it says. Amen. Because it says we cannot sin. And that means, as in we cannot be under that bondage, that continual sinning, that we cannot break because Jesus broke it for us. And we are a new man. We are separate, a new creature. And when we strive against sin, though we may sin, that's not falling under the heading of one who's continually committing it. I'm telling you, you cannot continually commit sin and say, I'm a Christian. No. The Bible says it right here is where it says. There's a need in the heart. There's a need in the heart. And it's to get right. And it's to get right. The committing of sin is an act of doing or continual practicing is what it's talking about. Because we know that we're, we know that when we even look at the words, that that's what they mean. But even if you take it at face value, that would mean that no one. If we would say, whosoever born of God does not commit sin, well, we still sin. I still make mistakes. But I know that I'm born of God. I know it. I strive against sin because I don't like sin. I hate sin. Don't want to do it. Why? Because Jesus put that desire in you. In me. When we strive against it, but when one will continually do it and be okay with it, I'm telling you now, the Bible is clear that it says a good tree cannot bring forth both sweet and bitter fruit. Right. It just makes a line. There is a clear Amen. line. It differentiates. It does. When we strive against sin, we know. Why? Because we don't want it. Because our nature's been changed. But when someone, I don't care what their testimony is, if they continually do it, they didn't get saved. I'm telling you, they ain't right with God. They can't right. be. Because the Bible cannot. You can't compromise this. It's clear. It's clear. Maybe they got it here. Who knows? I can't judge them. Neither can you. We can go into doctrine of this and doctrine of that. But the, choice, the, the truth of the matter is that there's a need. There's a need. And the need is for Christ. And the need is for deliverance from slavery and from bondage. But the Son, Jesus said, abideth forever. That's what he told him. He says, slave. He says, he can be sold at any time. 
The Bible even says this in Romans 6 and 16. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself, servants who obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. It says, When you yield yourself unto righteousness, when your child of God strives against sin and yields unto himself in obedience, it's unto righteousness. But when there's one that yields himself unto sin, they're the servant of sin. Where you yield yourself, where you yield yourself. He says, But the Son abideth forever, the true child of God. Is free. He is free. He's a new man. And you can believe that. That's believer's assurance. Amen. I'll tell you now. If you can be sure, you can be no, no doubt. No doubt. Number three, the personal liberty. Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There was a Roman custom at this time. There was a Roman custom. And this may be what Jesus was talking about. We don't know. But we know that if Jesus makes you free, you're free. He's the only one. Ain't no one else can do it. But there was also a Roman custom that he may have been alluding to at this time that if the Father would die, if the father would die, the son could, if he choose, if he will, he could choose to set free every slave that was born in his father's house. He could give them freedom if he choose to do so. I want you to know something. Jesus can give freedom to whosoever he did so. He can do it. Why? Because he died on the sin once, is what he did. And now he ever lived to make intercession for the transgressors. That means Jesus Christ, when you come to him, Realizing that you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because you're under the bondage of sin. And when you will come to Him, confessing your sin with your mouth, believing in Jesus Christ as Lord, having died for your sin and rose again from the grave, now He can set you free. If you will call on His name, you'll be saved. God makes salvation simple, folks. He really does. Simple. Simple. The personal liberty is Jesus Christ. The cause is to make you free. That means to cause someone to receive freedom. That means that there was a work that had to be done. That means that there was a call for something. And that call was for the Jesus Christ to die for sin. In Matthew 26, 28, it says, For this is my blood, the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sin. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And it says, By stripes we're healed, is what it says. Jesus Christ, there was a cause. He's the one who can make you free. The Son will make you free. Why? Because of what He's done for you and I. You shall be free indeed. That means free and clear. That means sin gone. That means, hey, all those old sins, history, they're gone. They're gone. The person of liberty. He said, if the Son, salvation is found only by a special source, and that source is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Only Jesus was holy and sinless enough to be able to present His body as sacrifice. For you and I, I could die for you, but I won't do anything. Why? Because I fall in the same heading as you. I've sinned from the glory of God. Now, I pray today that you're a Christian like me. I pray today that you, we, we all know that. Don't get me wrong. But listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. Jesus was the only one, the only one that could have done what was done, what was needed. It was Him. Amen. It was the only God, Son of God. There was none else. There is no else. People say today, listen, they say, I heard a story this person said, I was born a Hindu, I'm going to die a Hindu, because Allah, or I don't know, maybe they meant Muslim, I'm not sure, I, I don't understand all of that, but I do know they serve a God. They said, there's only one God, that's it. No, 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 no. There are many other gods, little G, O, D, S, but there's only one, capital L. Capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah. There's only one. Amen. There is only one true God, the Bible says. Amen. And that is the only one that exists. There's many other gods today that people serve. They are false. They, they, they are fallible. And they are proven false. But only Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, come from the Father, was the one who was capable of redeeming man from Amen. underneath the oppression of Satan and sin. The right. only one. There was none else. When he says you shall be free indeed, this is what that means. It means to be relieved from all various kinds of ownership and confinement and distress, oppression, sickness, and the release of the sinner from sin. The Bible says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Do you know what that means? That means that the most... the, the the most perfect person you've ever met, that you say perfect, we say perfect. That person that you think of that might be the most perfect person you've ever met, it is not, they are not good enough for heaven. The best person you could you ever think of is 
is not good enough for heaven. The best that they could do is like taking a filthy rag and shoving it up the face of God. Why? Because the heart is still lost. It's still in sin and can never be changed apart from Jesus Christ. God says, I'll give you a new heart. That's why the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new creature. Why? Because the old one is stuck on your sin. But the new one is made free from out underneath that bondage. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus. Right. It is Jesus. And 2 Corinthians 3 11 says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Freedom. Amen. There is freedom. There is freedom. And I'll close with this. Psalm 107 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Say so. So! Amen. 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 So! I'm redeemed of the Lord. So! People need to know. So. Amen. They need to. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. One of the marks of a Christian, I'll tell you now, is that he will profess his salvation. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus don't make secret disciples. Right. You will take a stand with the Lord and you will confess him and say so. Say so. May we never forget our spiritual independence day. Never. Because Jesus Christ, there was a battle. There was a declaration. And it was fulfilled. And there was blood that was shed to fulfill it. And that blood was Jesus. Don't ever forget your independence. Jesus Christ made you and I new if he's our Savior. He made it possible to set us free. If everyone will bow their heads and close their eyes and listen. If you're here this morning and you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are under the bondage of sin. There's nothing that you can do. You can't work for it. You can't pay enough money. You can't do enough good to get yourself out from underneath it. It's beyond your control. But if you will realize today that Jesus Christ paid that price for you, having done no wrong but suffered for your wrongs and your sin, in which all, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God, if you will today realize that you need Christ, because you're lost. That means if you died today, you would not make heaven. Why? Because Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior. If that's you today, and you have enough care for your soul, with no one looking around, that you will acknowledge that today. And by that acknowledgement, you will lift your hand just high enough for me to see it to know that I need to pray for you. Because you need to be saved. Is there everyone here today that would raise their hand up? And by that, I will pray for you. I am coming down to rip you out of your seat. I will pray for you. I will pray for you. Is there anyone here this morning? Christian, I don't know what your need here is today. But I do know if God paid such high price for our freedom, for our liberty from sin, what is in the sight of the Lord that other need? It's but a light thing that He's able to so freely in these days. Do you believe me for it? Are you living right? Can you say from your heart that you're striving against sin? I want you to know something today. If there is a need in the house of God, I'm the one who can meet it right now. If you have a need here today, I don't even know what it is, but I pray for you. If you raise your hand up to acknowledge that, prayer for it. If there be someone here today saying, preacher, pray for me, and raise your hand up because you've got a need. Don't need to know what it is. God bless you. Someone else, God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else, real quick, if you have a need today, God bless you. If you cast that care upon him, know that he cares for